Uh, there were two characters that uh, were, were important to have representation. One was the 75-year-old cop, Rusty, I think, mm -hmm. that brought up the point that many of the cops didn't live in the area that they were policing, and Portland is in the same situation. Another character that was very important to have representation was Doug Ray. This person that uh, has become more and more a part of Portland as well, and continues to bring things to Portland maybe that the community doesn't necessarily want or doesn't necessarily agree with. Purity, cleanliness, whiteness, um, that count bearing flags. Where do we go as a community with these things, these characters, these people, when these things are coming into Portland, affect us in different ways and different uh, struggles. And we have Zabrowski's who are getting bloodied and other people, Betsy Hall, who are being arrested and 70 year old white women um, that were not even in protests, but were passing through and are being forced to the ground or their knees are being hit to the ground and breaking their nose, bloodying them. This is, a really hard place to be when the victims are the ones with the power and authority, not the ones with the bloody noses. That's right. um, where do we go as the community from here? Because the city hall answer is a good answer, but the community also needs to act as like community policing as well. We are not beholden to the people with weapons, but we're beholden to each other. Yes. So, when uh, you see white nationalists marching down the street downtown, you should drop a dime to the mayor and the police chief and say that that's just not the city we want to live in, right? It took me getting to City Hall before City Council actually passed a resolution condemning white supremacy. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's good, right? Uh, and I wasn't gonna sign on to it, right? Because I'm like, I, I don't need a symbolic anything, right? I, I am a black woman in America, right? I know how dangerous it is just to exist today. <laughs> I have never been afraid in Portland. I mean, I moved here in what was called the height of the gang activity, right? I'm from Baltimore, right? Portland doesn't know gangs, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but when I moved here, right, I was told, like, whatever you do, don't go to inner Northeast Portland, right? Because it's just overrun with gang activity, right? So when I got a job in Northeast Portland, I got a front in Northeast Portland, right? Um, and so what I learned from that experience is that the community is powerful here. It can be. But what you've done is lost your voice, right? What you've done is lost your ability to envision something that's different than what we have right now. I encourage you to talk to your neighbors, right? Get five of you together in your kitchen, right? Talk about what you want for Portland, right? Then develop a plan. The thing that made me crazy after 45 was elected wasn't that there was more people that got engaged and involved in the political process. The thing that made me crazy was that everybody went out and started a new group. <laughs> to not think that people had been working on civil rights and immigrant rights and all this other stuff before 45 was elected, right? But no, what we did was work to the people that we knew and we started new groups, right? Disband those groups, join some of the historic groups, we've been working on these issues forever, right? There's power in knowledge, right? You gotta find like minded people. You know, I talk to everybody. Because even if there are people who think that they're staunchly opposed to my perspective, I can find some commonality. We can find something in common. Well, let's work on that, right? Forget about the stuff we, don't dis we disagree on, because that will work itself out, right? We can do that at another table. But let's just work on the stuff we agree on. And let me just say this, because we are in progressive white Portland. We need progressive white Portlanders to step in in places that I can't. Yes, mm -hmm. We need you to actually draw a line in the sand, right? We need you, you must do that, because that's how things will change, right? Because you know, black folks can march around City Hall morning, noon, and night, people don't quite pay that much attention, right? But when white, white folks say we've had enough, 
and we're going to join with the black folks and the Latino folks and the Native American folks, and we're going to show you our real power as a community. That's when change happens, right? That's what I need you to do. I need you to just like make yourself a little uncomfortable, right? Get, get comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? And then work on the stuff you agree on, and then come and make me and my colleagues accountable for what it is you want. Yes. I have to say that um, frequently I, I will call on Jeff Berkeley's office right. along the line to, to give feedback about the issues that are important mm -hmm. to me. And they, there's always somebody will take your right. um, message. You'll speak to somebody, mm -hmm. right? right. Calling the mayor's office mm -hmm. in the city? Uh uh. <laughs> You're never going to get through where you can leave a voicemail. Uh -huh. That's bullshit. How does that make you feel? Right. About it? I have no idea if anybody ever listens. But that's, that's what I was saying, you call. So I make sure if you call my office, somebody will call you back. I make sure that you email my office, somebody's gonna email you back, right? Um, I can't speak for the other offices, but I, there's a fear at City Hall. I, I, this is what I learned in three months later now. City Hall operates under constant fear. Fear of getting it wrong, fear of getting bad press, Fear of taking accountability, fear of making a decision. Fear. City Hall is full of fear. They're great people who work for the city. They're dedicated public employees. But the leadership pretty much operates constantly in a state of fear. I mean, I'll, I'll say, you know, I want to do such and such. Well, I don't know if the mayor likes that. Well, the mayor's not the boss of me. I care if the mayor likes it. Right? All I need to do is get some more votes. It's cool if the mayor likes it, but if he doesn't, I'm cool too, right? <laughs> um, so that's that's my challenge, right? Uh, yes. Um, thank you so much for being you. <laughs> um, appreciate it. Um, I just recently watched uh, 13. Mm. And if you're not familiar with it, it's a movie that came out dealing with the 13th Amendment. Mm -hmm. And in that, the main thing was everybody be as free except for criminals. Mm -hmm. And so with the laws that then they took that, and I think it was Clinton that did this mass incarceration and all of that. How is that directly, the federal funding, affecting what's going on here in Portland? Because I'd like to do something, but I'm not sure what to do and how to do it. So on your end, how, how does that federal money and budget stuff right. trickle down for us? And so, you're right. Uh, though they did talk on crime, 80s and 90s, right? Mm -hmm. Democrats and Republicans were trying to out uh, talk on crime each other, right? So what we now have is a criminal justice system uh, that we spend more money on than we do on our higher education, right? And so the good news, though, is this legislative session, there is an effort to make changes to ballot measure 11, which is the mandatory minimum law that if you're 15 years old or older, you have the privilege of serving your time in adult prison uh, for a whole list of about 28 different crimes. Um, when, we, when that was voted in, I knew that that would have a detrimental impact on black and brown communities, and it, is, it, it, it has done that, right? But what it's also done is broken the state budget. So it's not that our politicians are now more progressive than they were when we first voted in those kids on, on crime laws. It's that they need the money, right? And they realize that the prisons are sucking up the dollars that should be going into our education system, right? And so they're not doing it because it's the right thing to do, they're doing it because they're trying to save money. But having said that, they're trying to make changes to Measure 11, whereas uh, youth between 15 and 18 don't automatically get remanded to adult court right. in prison, right? Mm -hmm. That they actually spend their time in the juvenile system, and at the end of the juvenile time, they get assessed by a judge as to whether or not they should be released or they should serve more time in the adult facility. Mm -hmm. So I would say contact your state representatives and your state senators, tell them to support these criminal justice reforms. Last legislative session, we decriminalized uh, possession of drugs, right? We still have not erased all the harm that tough or crime marijuana conditions have done while we have people making a million dollars a day selling marijuana, right? Uh, that's something we must do, right? So anyone who's been convicted of marijuana in this state, other states have done it. We should just wipe the slate clean, right? right? Yeah. 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 I talked about the, uh, two employees, maybe one supervisor, right? 
that's ridiculous. And I said to the chief, well, you meet people on the street, why aren't you just like cutting out some of that mid-management, right, and putting them on the street? Oh, well, there are union contracts involved. And I said, who signed a contract that you would have one supervisor for every two employees, right? No other Fortune 500 company would do that, right? Why would we do that, right? So that's why we've got to change that. <laughs> we knew the police. Yes. Because they walked the neighborhood. That's right. They didn't drive. That's they right. walked the neighborhood. Right. They knew the family. Right. And there was a whole lot of this crime. Right. No, yeah, we have, as I said, we've given our power to the police bureau. The city leadership has turned over oversight to the police bureau. It's time for us as a community to decide how we want to be policed. And they create the community conditions whereby we can make that happen. And so that includes who trains those police officers, where we recruit those police officers. We should be in high schools now identifying good community police officers mm -hmm. and right. mentoring them now so that when they get out of high school, we help support them getting through two years of college as they're making their way 